a few additional pearls along our necklace journey. We leave our anchorage in Tracy Arm and dodge the ice flows from Dawes and Sawyer glaciers. Here are a couple of still photos of gulls on ice. An enormous amount of water passes in and out of a relatively narrow channel with every change in the tide. So the currents are powerful and the water's rough. Normally, we head to Juneau, the capital of Alaska, but we learn over the radio that the marinas are all full, so we head directly for Ork Bay, only a few land miles from Juneau, but much further by sea. Even in Ork Bay, moorings are first come, first served, and we are lucky to find a good spot. It doesn't apply to us, but to anyone who boats with dogs, this scene will be a familiar twice daily routine, which in this case includes dodging the passing traffic. A bald eagle observes the action. On any boat, there are always jobs to be done. In this case, our anchor chain counter has ceased to count. Chris figures out a temporary alternative by attaching colored cable ties every 50 feet along the chain. Steve assists Chris in measuring the intervals. The ties have a short life, so redundancies are needed. Once done, the chain retainer is put back in place, an important safeguard against the anchor chain deploying while underway. Steve has brought with him a Starlink system for us to try, and Chris prepares a temporary installation. We know we are too far north for this to function, so more about this in a later video. The clouds move in as we prepare to leave the slip. First stop is the fuel dock, where we take on 475 US gallons. It is wise to take on fuel while you can as fuel docks are few and far between. A pair of adult bald eagles observe our departure. The white patch below the mountains is the Mendenhall Glacier, close by Juneau. We are heading for Port Frederick, a rather misleading name for a deep inlet with no actual port. On the way, we pass the small First Nation town of Huna, where a couple of huge cruise ships are moored. One with striking artwork at the bow. The Carnival Splendor has its own work of art. What a strange way to go to sea. This island plays host to well-named Chimney Rock. It is the perfect, secure location for a hard-to-spot eagle's nest. Tonight, we share our anchorage with a fishing boat. The distant peaks reflect the glow of the setting sun.
At dawn, around four o'clock, the water is mirror calm. Once underway, Venture's bow cuts a V-shaped arrow through the placid waters. We continue north up Port Frederick with distant views of the coastal mountains. We enter Icy Bay and Chris suggests that under such rare, calm conditions we should use this opportunity to revisit stunning and infamous Latuya Bay. We stop, think about it for all of 30 seconds and agree. The wheel is spun 90 degrees to port and we head for Cape Spencer Lighthouse, barely visible in the distance. If we continue, we will reach the dangerous entrance into Latuya Bay, ahead of slack water, so we need to delay. But, where to go? We decide to take a look at Dick's arm. The chart shows a narrow inlet with a rock-strewn entrance. We cautiously enter along the back door of the lighthouse into a narrow but beautiful and calm inlet. We encounter a mother bear with her cubs. Here we wait for two hours before threading our way back out through the rocky entrance into the Gulf of Alaska. We have 40 miles to go amid boisterous head seas. The Fairweather Range and coastal mountains follow this entire coast with the highest peak being Mount Fairweather at over 15,000 feet. Another outstanding landmark is La Perouse Glacier. It is now 10 p.m. with the setting sun low in the sky as we approach the tricky entrance to our destination marked by Cormorant Rock. The gulf is now reasonably calm and the tide is slack but turbulence still roils the water in an entrance just 50 yards wide. Once inside, the water becomes completely calm. We pass Cenotaph Island and drop the hook, just as the sun slips below the horizon. The following morning, the line delineating the older and younger trees is clear to see. In this spot, on the evening of July the 9th, 1958, an earthquake dislodged 90 million tons of rock, precipitating a wave initially 1,720 feet high, which swept the length of the bay, clearing the shoreline down to bedrock. Today, the trees still bear witness to that cataclysmic event. The mist slowly dissipates under the warmth of the sun, revealing the mountains in all their glory. A whisper of waterfalls fills the air. It is time to take the tender to explore the bay
We head first to Cenotaph Island, where flocks of black-legged kittiwakes whirl about our heads and nest on the cliff in vast numbers. They are joined by cormorants and gulls. The tiny white spot beyond the tip of Cenotaph Island marks venture at anchor and gives scale to her surroundings. We visit the site of the rock fall which precipitated the 1958 event. It could not happen today because what used to be water is now land. On the return journey we photograph venture against the backdrop of the towering peaks. The following day, we head down to La Chaussée Spit, which divides the bay from the gulf. The plan is to go beachcombing along the ocean side of the spit, with the remains of downed trees from 1958 still litter the shore. But while seeking a suitable landing spot among the rocks, a mother bear appears with two young cubs, cavorting on the only rock-free area. Here is a lovely still shot by Steve. Clearly, it is unwise to go ashore, a decision reinforced by the appearance of a male bear. Sadly, circumstance dictates we must now move on from this bewitching place. <laughs>